got the green wire, the green light, excuse me. And we had, uh, we had a very good drive coming up, or down rather, and uh, must be just on Sunday, but the traffic seemed to be accommodating and polite. And that's not usual. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. How many times have we been here? Has it been the third time? Is that third time, Edie, I think? I think it was. Are you aware that uh, Dave, our brother Boulder, brother, uh, did he start the church? Bill Bowler, yes, yeah, yeah. He had some form of a connection through the uh, Heart to Heart uh, Bible Church also over in Phoenix. And that's where my wife and I got saved. <laughs> a small world. Yeah, amen. Okay, let's uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 1. We'll read down to and including verse 9. Now concerning the collection... For the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem." And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Now I will come unto you when I pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you, that you may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. But I tarry, I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Heavenly Father, we do ask that you would bless the reading of thy word and the teaching of it and the preaching of it. We ask for your will to be done and accomplished in, our, in all of our hearts and in the midst of our lives. We pray for Pastor and his family that you'll be with them and bring them safely back. Lord, that you'll bless and anoint him and uh, use him as you have here. And we'll give you the glory and all the praise for we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. And God's people said, Amen. 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 All right. And it is uh, good to be back, nice to be back. The thing that always throws me is the U-turn. Uh, we always, the way we come, we need to take a U-turn, turn around and go back and come back to the road of our turnoff. That's fine. Whatever it takes to get us here, amen. Okay, we're, gonna be, we're going to be looking at, if we put a title on this, it's five great doors. And obviously our text is verse 9. This chapter that we've uh, just began to read, and we are just reading the verse 9, but it was written by Paul as he was on his way to Jerusalem. The first four verses uh, deal with the subject of giving the missions. Paul was perhaps the greatest preacher uh, that ever did live. No, not much doubt about it. He was uh, a man that wanted with all of his heart to have the Lord's will in his life. In verse 7, he said this, But I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. Now, our text uh, deals with Paul's realization of the Lord giving him a wonderful opportunity for, uh, for service. Verse 9 says this, A great door and effectual is opened unto me. Now, the Lord 
has opened a door before each one of his people. And uh, it is, it too is effectual, and we'll notice this in a moment, as uh, was Paul's. Now, the word effectual in the received text, uh, the original Greek, the manuscript where the King James Bible uh, uh, came from, it is preserved, the preserved word of God, is number one, effectual means a powerful door. In other words, no one but Jesus can open that door. Secondly, it means an active door. The door of opportunity from the Lord is always open. It is never too late in our lifetime to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And thirdly, effectual means a constructive door. Uh, the Lord never tears down, ever. Uh, his open door always builds lives for his glory. It always does. So there are five doors in our text this morning that uh, we'd like to look at. First of all, there is the door of opportunity. And that can be seen in three areas. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12, I'll just read the verse. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach uh, Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. So here we have the first area of a, uh, a door of opportunity. First of all, do what you can for Jesus while you can, while you can do it. Uh, soon, it may be too late. We, uh, we just made a, uh, what I believe is going to be our final move. We, uh, we went, and I say that in all sincerity, uh, that we, we made a move after we were here previously at uh, your church, your good church. I uh, started getting phone calls from Lake Michigan, not the lake, but the town. And the church is called Liberty Baptist Church. And the, the issue and the problem and the need they had, they had been without a pastor for over a year. And uh, they said, we, we were wondering, can you help us? Uh, would you come and be our pastor? I said, no, I don't have. And see, we're working out of Florence Baptist Church. And I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, uh, the pastor of our church during that tenure. He started it is Pastor Dale Storm. How many of you ever, okay, are you aware of the Lord took him home? Okay. And that was what, a year from last Wednesday, I believe it was. So uh, they said, uh, would you, how would you come and help us? I said, I would come and be your interim on the basis that you follow my leadership and that we do exactly what the Lord leads in order to get a pastor, call him. And they said, we'll do it. So we moved there. We moved. We could not find a house in Lake. So we found a house about eight miles south of St. Helen, uh, not too far from Houghton Lake. And we drove right at 50 miles every Sunday to go to the church. So make a long sh uh, story short, because we're there just short of a year. Uh, the, uh, we had moved the services from Sunday morning, we kept those, Sunday school, but because of the distance, I asked, how do you feel about moving the p.m. service, 6 p.m., to follow the morning service? We'll have a little bit of a break. If you ever want to have a potluck dinner, you can have it there. I'll speak during that time. Then uh, we'll, have the, uh, we'll have the evening service, and we'll go home at approximately two o'clock or earlier. Usually it was earlier because the service ended right at about uh, 12 noon. And uh, so we, you know, obviously went home a little bit earlier than that. But I was asked to preach across town, nine, 10 miles across town in, in Lake Michigan at another church. And it was not Liberty Baptist. It was Lake Baptist Church. And the pastor there of 14 years 
who happened to have graduated from the seminary that I went to and my wife uh, went to, and that was Midwestern Baptist College. And we were over at his house having dinner, and he said, by the way, there's a young man uh, that's coming, and he's looking for, in the North Country, a church to pastor. I said, well, you're retiring. He said, yes, but the church wants an older man. I said, how old is he? He said, he's 28. They have three children uh, between uh, him and Taylor, his wife. Well, they had another one when they did call him. And I was excited because I met with him for about 15 minutes before the preaching of the service in the evening. And I called uh, the deacon. I was their advisor for the pulpit committee. They asked me to do that. I didn't vote, but I was their advisor. And uh, I said, I've got a man here I believe is your next pastor. Because we'd been through about, my goodness, eight or nine looking high and low. And for any reason at all, you, you either couldn't get them or you wouldn't want them. And I'm just being sh- uh, right, shooting straight across the bow. So I, I spoke with Brother Doyle, and they said, uh, yes, we want him to come. He preached the next Sunday. And uh, the following Sunday, they brought him as a potential candidate. 100% call to be potential. And then there was about a three, four week break and they brought him back to candidate. 100% vote. He accepted without any reservation. The church was running 45 to 48, sometimes 50. It was running much smaller than that when we came. And the offerings increased and went up. The Lord was blessing. And uh, one Sunday I talked to Brother uh, Doyle and I said, how many did you have this morning? He said, 74. We had 71 the Sunday before that. And I thought, praise the Lord, you never make a mistake. Amen. Amen. So we have in Matthew 25 and verse 10, I'll read that one verse. But we need to be able to do for Jesus what we're capable of doing right now. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. The door was open for action, and the door closed. And you know, if we're not careful, and we do not seek to serve the Lord, doors are open all the time. It's effectual. It's a powerful door of opportunity that comes from Jesus. But if we're not cautious and obey the Lord, the door can close on us. And God does not want that. So the first is do what you can for Jesus while you're able. The second thought is bring in souls to hear the gospel before it's too late. Now, I see that there's two forms of soul winning. There is the form of soul winning when you talk to people on a direct one-to-one basis. You can knock on doors, carry tracks, tell them about your good church, or you can just talk to somebody one-on-one, maybe a loved one, or otherwise, and you seek to lead them to a saving knowledge of Christ. The other is inviting people to church. Now, you know, um, I think over the years we've seen a lot, several, of people, I'm talking about from members. Now, we've seen several people say, but ourselves between Edie and I, but our our members, the churches that we pastored or started, uh, they would take tracks, they'd go out, they'd talk to people, and maybe they're in grocery shopping, and they'd give a tract to the cashier, or maybe somebody working down the aisle, or maybe another fellow shopper, and lo and behold, we'd see some of those folks attend. And you know, a lot of those folks came to Christ. I remember a church we started in Vermont and between uh, Montpelier and Barrie, just about Bullseye, a little town called Berlin. And uh, they had a brook trout stream that ran behind the church. I mean, it was, you know, I became familiar with that place uh, very much. But then we'd baptize in that same stream a little distance away where the pools were larger. And we'd uh, baptize until ice started forming on the edge of the stream. Then we'd drive to Shelburne 
uh, at First Baptist, Independent Baptist, and we would baptize new converts. One Sunday, we took the Sunday school bus up after the, uh, was that on a Sunday or a Saturday? It was on a Saturday. Was it? it wasn't. Okay, I'm sorry. But we had over 30 people coming there, and we baptized, and the pastor was shocked of the church. And I mean, that's good. Uh, but I, I'll tell you what, do what you can, and then bring souls, and bring them to hear the gospel. And guess what? You're going to reap on some of those precious souls. Luke chapter 14 and verse 23 says this, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house might be full or filled. So we we spent uh, oh my some a few years in Alaska, and you know the ministry and the Lord has taken us several locations, and um, I was on staff at a large church in Anchorage, and the pastor said, um, "What can you what can you do?" Because uh, I I came. He asked me. He said, "Have you ever won somebody to Christ?" And I said, yes. I said, I'll give you some references if you wish. And he called them. And, uh, and some of those were people we led to Christ. But while we're there, he said, would you start a soul winning uh, ministry? I said, how about if we start a fisherman's club? We'll just start the club. And, and that is soul winning. So I remember a man in the soul winning club, the fisherman's club, uh, wept at a meeting, a certain meeting. And I, I, I mean, he was weeping audibly. There were men and women in this soul winning uh, class, soul winning club. There was over 100 people in this class. And, and when it first started, and it began, still grew, but he was weeping audibly out loud. And I said, brother, why are, why are you troubled today? I mean, before we could go on with the class, you know, that could dampen the spirit. We wanted to help him. And he, uh, he said that how the Lord told him to witness to a fellow employee. He said he would wait until the next morning on this particular day. His employee, fellow employee, on a break, said, yes, you can uh, talk to me. He said, I have to leave immediately after work. But he said, uh, uh, maybe you could, uh, we could meet or whatever. Well, early that morning, the next morning, the man was killed on the way to work that he wanted to talk to Jesus about. That broke his heart, and he wept openly. And I, I remember a couple of services the tears would flow down his cheek. He just could not control it. He was broken. Now, the third is read God's word every single day. Just read it consistently. And Romans ten seventeen says, So then faith cometh uh, by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It is the only way for you and I to grow spiritually. We read the Word of God separately every morning, and then my wife and I read uh, the uh, uh, Word of God. We're going through the Old Testament uh, now, and it is an encouragement. It really is. Now, God's Word presents a clear picture to, uh, to us in our lives and to others. I want to give you an illustration I understand this is true to life. I wouldn't want to be this man. But uh, a man was uh, taking his uh, friends on tour of an art gallery in effort to show all of those in his uh, party that he knew paintings. He began to criticize certain paintings, and a lot of those were famous. But he began to criticize the paintings and uh, when uh, and he had left his glasses at home that day, of all things, and he stood before this certain painting and picture, and here's what he said: 
This is a quotation that was taken down. The frame is altogether out of harmony with the subject. The subject is of poor quality. In fact, the man in the painting is so ugly and the painting is so poor in quality. He said, by this time, the wife stepped over to him. She was standing alongside him. She interrupted him. She kind of nudged him, kicked him in the foot and stopped him. And she said, here's what she said, honey, you are talking about your own face because you're looking in the mirror. And he had forgotten his glasses, do you understand? And that's like the word of God. The word of God will criticize a person without respect. With God, there's no respect of persons, amen? And so when we do this, the Bible does not hide our sins from us. Secondly, there's the door of prayer. Matthew 6, 6, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth uh, in secret, <coughs> pardon me, will reward thee openly. Now, how about the door of prayer? There's uh, just a couple of things about that. Uh, it is the way to receive all your needs. And the way to receive all your needs is to talk to Jesus about it. You have a need? Talk to him about it. Matthew 21, 22, In all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Now, when we started, and we did start a church in Vermont, in Berlin, and uh, we, have, uh, we have six children. I've lost count. How many grandchildren do we have? 24? Twenty-five, right? Two of them are still in the oven. Pardon? Two of them are still in the oven. <laughs> okay. Yeah. They haven't hatched yet. Okay. <laughs> um, but we had uh, we had gone up to start the Liberty Baptist Church in in uh, in Berlin. Uh, um, I want to say New Hampshire, but it's Vermont, and. Um, our boys had grown up to the point that they needed something, you know. They, you know, uh, getting out around the church building. And we lived in the bottom of the church. We found an old two-room schoolhouse. And um, uh, the gentleman that owned the rock quarry agreed to give it six months without rent. And we could start paying rent. When the church is able, they can buy it. The whole thing, 11 acres, the beautiful building and everything, for $40,000. And we thought, boy, not a bad deal. So what we did is we wanted to get our, our boys some bikes. So uh, one day, Edie was uh, working uh, and doing work in the uh, our apartment down below. And um, she said, uh, now's a good time to get those two bikes for the boys, our boys, if you want to. And we had two sons, 12-year period, then we had uh, uh, begin to have our other uh, uh, children. We have three girls and three boys, or three young men. So I took $50, all we had. We were poor back then, 50 bucks. And I drove to St. Albans, uh, Vermont. And at a hardware store, they had bikes lined up. Winter's coming, you know, fall, and, and getting rid of all their bikes, supplies. And they had them all lined up. And I looked at the bikes, and I thought, these two are perfect. And I went in, and I said, is the manager here? And they said, he's right over there. I said, sir, could you come out with me, and can I show you these two bikes? And he said, sure. I said, um, how much are these two bikes? He said, they're, 
we got them marked down. They're fifty dollars a piece. And I had fifty dollars. I had fifty dollars. Two boys. And I looked at him and I said, uh, "We've got two sons." Uh, he said, "What brings you to Vermont?" I was so glad he asked me. And we came to start Liberty Baptist Church. Told him about the schoolhouse. He knew all about that that schoolhouse. It had been closed nearly forty years. Forty years. The the building was all hard rock maple. It was a I mean, man, it was nothing going to knock that thing down. And uh, he said, now back to the bikes. He said, uh, 50 apiece. I said, would you consider selling those just a little bit cheaper? He said, what do you have? I said, all we have is $50. He looked at those bikes, and he smiled, and he said, they're yours. So we got the bikes for 25 apiece, and that was all that we had, and, uh, and, and so on. So he yelled, and everybody in the store heard him. He said, sold, and I yelled back, praise the Lord. And he looked back at me and shocked me. He said, amen. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to witness to him yet, but found out shortly that he was a born-again believer. Amen. Now, what are we supposed to do? When we're looking at the door of prayer, we are to pray for each other. That will help to unify and strengthen the body of believers in the local church. Listen in Luke 22 and verse 32. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. I was a pastor of a church in Mesa, Arizona. Uh, started there in 1990. The church used to be called Fellowship Bible Baptist. It was on, it is rather, on Power Road. And I believe it's called uh, Sawara Hills Baptist Church now. But um, but uh, when we were there, there was a man that, uh, a, a lady in the church uh, began praying, and the church began praying for a man by the name of Jim Wilson. Brother Jim Wilson uh, needed a job badly to care for his family. And the Lord gave him a job, good morning, in just one week's time to take care of his family. And so no matter what or where the church is located, doesn't make a bit of difference Prayer is needed to care for the body of believers, for each other. And sad to say, a prayer meeting is one of the services that is least attended. There's thirdly on the point of the outline. There's the door to fellowship. And remember, these doors are effectual. They're strong. And uh, so there are three thoughts about fellowship in the local church and with others. First of all, with the Lord Jesus himself, there must be fellowship. Listen to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. <clears throat> and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. There was a... Um, there was a man that, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> I do not have COVID. I want to set you at ease. We had it before we moved from Michigan. Went on the, um, went on the quarantine. See, we haven't had a uh, vaccine. And uh, that's a matter of a personal conviction. That's all that is. <coughs> but... Um, uh, this man was giving a tour of his factory that he owned. It was a large factory. And it was in fabric and thread uh, uh, producing. And as he went through and took the group, uh, they went ahead and looked at hundreds of looms spinning of a very fine thread. And the owner said, 
if just one thread breaks, the entire factory shuts down. There are hundreds of people working there. And what do you think he did? He reached over and he snapped a thread and everything uh, came right down to nothing. It just didn't run anymore. And then they went ahead and bound the thread and they had a little tool and they put the thread together and bind it. It was like a glue and they'd compress it. And, and so when he did that, gave a twink on the thread, everything began to run again. And so it was so fine-tuned. Now, that's like our fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. One little act of disobedience, just one, is like the thread breaking in the factory. It can break and hurt and damage our relationship with the Lord Jesus so that our, our fellowship with him, not salvation, but our fellowship can cease. It is not until the thread is rejoined will our joy in Christ be restored. Secondly, there's fellowship with other Christians. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37 to 39. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So here's a good gauge. Who your friends are, many cases, can tell where your heart is with Jesus and others in the body of Christ. Thirdly, fellowship. There is fellowship in suffering with Christ. Have you ever suffered with the Lord Jesus? And you went through something, but you felt oh so close to him, even though you were suffering and your heart was broke. Listen to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Now, there was a missionary in Africa that was just starting to get his, uh, his bearings, so to speak. And he told of uh, fjording many swift and dangerous rivers. And he would lose his footing and he would have to frantically swim either across the river and the rivers were rapid flowing or back to the shoreline from when he departed. One day, he was, a, uh, he, was a, 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 he was with several of the native people in that area. They were helping him to set up his place of ministry in the deep and, and the dark frontier part of that country. And what they did is they came to the river, and they did something he never thought he'd ever see. When they got to the river, they put the load on uh, with straps across their back and balanced across their shoulders. But they all took a large rock and took that rock and put it on their head. And they waded down into the rapid river. And because of the weight, it pushed their feet solidly to the bottom of the riverbed and they crossed without any kind of a problem. And that is the way it is for believers today, you and I. Uh, we each need a burden to bear, like the rock was a burden. We need a burden so that we'll not be swept away as we cross the streams of life. There is nothing anymore that our enemy, the devil, Satan, uh, literally, there's nothing he can do to stop a Christian whose feet are planted in the solid ground. Here's number four. We'll finish relatively short. There's the door of the coming of the Lord Jesus. Listen to James chapter 5 and verse 9. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. 
I love this. Behold the judge standeth at the door. It is so close for the coming of Jesus. So close. Now, you can see it if you look around. And uh, you can see it where countries are changing. Look at Canada. Canada is changing rapidly. France, England, other nations, they're just changing. But America's changing. And I never thought I'd ever see this. But our country's changing. And um, uh, so Jesus is coming. You know what is happening? When the rapture occurs in that one one thousandth of a second, the blinking or twinkling of an eye, when Jesus returns and takes us, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. That all takes place, listen, just like that. Not drug out. We watched a Christian film yesterday. And the rapture, the sky was glowing. Well, we enjoyed the film. But when they got to the rapture, it must have taken 15 minutes. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> that's a little off key and a little off scripture. But during that time, right after the rapture, total confusion, chaos, I agree with that. And who's going to come on the scene? They need somebody. So all the nations now are being prepared for control. For control. Masks, COVID, that's all part of a control. It really is. Dominate, put people under control. Threaten the IRS to look at your bank account. If you've got over $600, you, you've heard of that one. That's coming down the pike. It's ridiculous. However, I'd like to say that there are at least three things that the rapture should cause all of us, each of us, to do. Number one, it should cause us to live and be pure for Jesus. Amen. First John 3, 3. And every man that hath his hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. In Medina, New York, um, we, it was not a church plant. It was already existing. But we came to a church, what do you think, 13 people maybe? Maybe. And it was Faith Bible Baptist. We started a Christian school there. By the time we left, the, the, the church run, the school's running probably 140, 130. And the church is running 225. And that's in two-year time, and the church is in a cornfield. Now, I say all of that to say all of this. There was a man that I met. His wife started coming to church. His name was Chris Stewart. When I met Chris, every time I came to the house, Chris would come to the door, good morning, and he would cuss me out. You ever been cussed out? Yeah, but he would cuss me out before he got saved. Then he got saved. And one Sunday before the morning service, Chris came over to me and here's what he said. Preacher, Jesus is coming soon. He said he's coming soon. What a change from cursing to blessing. He, he does it all. Jesus does it all. Secondly, it is an incentive to have patience. That's the door of the coming of Jesus. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear uh, what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Oh, next time you sing. What's one of the words on that marvelous message we bring? Oh, and the title is, isn't it Jesus is coming again or coming soon? That is a fabulous song that portrays the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, thirdly, 
The second coming of Christ should cause us to have a life that is persistent. You can give up on everything in the world as much as you want, but don't give up on Jesus. Don't give up. He is the equipper through his spirit, the Holy Spirit. He will equip you and help you and give you all the direction and the peace and the hope that you may have in life at this point of time. So, persistence to be faithful in the work of Jesus on the earth until he returns. 1 Corinthians 4.2, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, it is required in student, Stuart, excuse me, that a man be found faithful. Here's our last point, and I'll just mention the point. The door of salvation. And there is an adversary. You know what the adversary is? What is that? Time. That's the adversary. That's the Very good. Have you heard me teach this before? No. But, uh, sir? Amen. Okay. We have 10 minutes to move around, fellowship, whatever you'd like to do. Drink coffee. And do oh, and donuts. And we have donuts over there. Oh, my. I see all kinds of interesting donuts. All right. Heavenly Father, we ask now that you'll bless and prepare our hearts for the morning service. And we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.